Our third change maker of the evening is uh, Salume Gesemian. She is a PhD student in the Department of Chemical Engineering, working with Professor Sasha Omanovich in the Electrochemistry and Corrosion Laboratory. Salume is going to tell us tonight about how we can use electricity to clean uh, wastewater to treat both the pharmaceutical drugs that we're flushing down our drains at an alarming rate, as well as to treat pathogenic microbes uh, that can cause illness and death as occurred in Walkerton, Ontario in May of 2000. And so Salume will tell us how to use electricity to purify our water. Salume. Thank you. If you brushed your teeth this morning, or took a shower, or had a cup of coffee, consider yourself lucky. For us, water is taken for granted. Clean drinking water is always within reach. But as we all know, this is not the case for everyone. Large parts of our world survive with insufficient drinking water. As Sarah, you told us already, 800 million people lack access to clean drinking water and that is one in nine people. Children cannot go to school because they have to walk hours to get daily supply of water. And this is not the case only in underdeveloped countries. In a developed country like Canada, there are also some people facing bad water conditions. At any given day, over 1,000 boil water advisories are in place across the country. How much water are we using? An average Canadian uses 329 liters of water per day, or around 10,000 liters of water per month. That is enough water to fill 100 bathtubs. A study in 2009 showed that Canadians ranked second only to the United States in terms of highest water use in the developed world. And they use more than twice as much as Europeans. How about wastewater production? An average Canadian produces 668 liters of wastewater each day. Only in Montreal, the daily production of wastewater ranges from 2,500 million liters per day on dry days up to 7,600 million liters per day on rainy days. So each day, we produce enough wastewater to fill Olympic Stadium. And that water needs to be treated before it is returned to San Lawrence River. So water treatment process plays a very important role in the water cycle. In Canada, one of the main reasons of contamination of water resources is mixing with untreated or improperly treated wastewater. This is what a conventional wastewater treatment process typically looks like. The screening and primary settling processes mainly remove floating and suspended solids and metal ions. Biological treatment uses microorganisms, primarily bacteria, to convert tough organic matter into simple substances and additional biomass. Then, the produced biomass and waste are removed in the secondary clarifier. And the last step is usually disinfection. But keep in mind that wastewater treatment process has to get rid of a wide variety of contaminants dissolved and suspended from small microorganisms to larger particles. Conventional wastewater treatment methods are in certain cases ineffective or insufficient for the removal of biorefractory organic compounds. And that is when advanced treatment options come into play. Advanced oxidation processes, or AOPs, are chemical oxidation processes that involve in-situ generation of highly reactive oxidizing agents, such as hydroxy radicals. AOPs were first proposed in 1980s for potable water treatment. But later, they were broadly applied for the treatment of different types of wastewater. AOPs include several technologies, such as electrochemical technology, ozonation, and so on. And they have several applications for wastewater treatment, including the reduction in total organic concentration and a specific pollutant destruction. Advanced oxidation processes are very efficient methods 
to increase the credibility of those organic matter that are difficult to degrade by means of biological treatment as a pretreatment step, or to remove those organic matter that are not treatable by biological processes at all as a post-treatment step. Among these AOPs, electrochemical metals have gained great attention in recent years for the treatment of wastewater containing organic compounds. In this image here, you see a typical electrochemical reactor for wastewater treatment, which includes an anode, a cathode, which are connected to a power source. Organic compounds are oxidized at the anode surface by losing electrons and are converted to CO2, water, and more simpler products. Anode here acts as a catalyst, and hence, this process is also called electrocatalysis. The electrons then travel to the other side of the cell, where there's some cathodic reactions, such as hydrogen evolution, take place. This process has many advantages, such as versatility, environmental compatibility, no need to add auxiliary chemicals, no need to high temperature and pressure, so safe operating conditions, easy process automation, minimum solid waste production, and so on. If a light source is added to the system, the process is called photoelectrochemical oxidation or photoelectrocatalysis at which the anode material plays an intermediate role in absorbing light energy and promoting desired reactions. Our focus in this work has been on the anode part and specifically anode material. Now that I talked about the theory, I move on to the experimental results. My experimental work started with preparation and screening of anode coatings composed of tin and tungsten oxide dubbed with a small amount of antimony oxide. Anode coatings with six different compositions of tin and tungsten oxide varying from 100% tungsten to 100% tin oxide were formed on pre-treated titanium substrate by a thermal deposition method. Then each of these electrode coatings was tested in photoelectrochemical process for a degradation of an, a model organic molecule, which in our case was phenol red. As you can guess from its name, phenol red has red color. In the picture above, you see phenol red in the samples taken from the reactor at different times during the experiments, filled in the cuvettes. And as you can see, the phenol red was almost completely removed from the system after about 120 minutes. The results for the removal of phenol red by using two processes of electrocatalysis, which is the use of electricity, and photoelectrocatalysis, which is the use of UV and electricity at the same time, are shown as graph bars. And as you can see, the coating composition with 80% tin oxide and 20% tungsten oxide exhibited the highest degradation percentage for removal of phenol red. So this coating composition was selected as our best candidate for further experiments. But in order to proceed and design our experiments, we had to know what the major threats to water quality are. One of the major threats is contamin contamination of water with pharmaceuticals, and another one is contamination with waterborne pathogens. First, I'm going, to talk about, I'm going to talk about the contamination with pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals have been detected in concentrations up to one microgram per liter in a wide variety of water samples from sewage flows, lakes, rivers, groundwaters, and seawaters. Although the concentration of these compounds in water bodies are very low, their continuous input may pose potential hazard to living organisms. A study in, reported in Germany in 2015 showed that most drug residues in wastewater come from households rather than pharmaceuticals, rather than hospitals and nursing facilities. These pharmaceuticals can come from human excretion or uh, disposal of uh, expired drugs into sinks or toilets. We chose a pharmaceutical, carbamazepine, 
to test the effectiveness of our selected coating composition for the removal of a drug. Carbamazepine is a widely used anti-epileptic drug and is persistent to conventional wastewater treatment methods and even some other advanced treatment methods. Here are the results for degradation of carbamazepine using both UV and electricity. As expected, by increasing the applied current, we obtained higher degradation of carbamazepine. However, for all applied currents, above 90% removal was obtained after about 20, 20 minutes. If we compare the results of the electrocatalysis process with photoelectrocatalysis process, we find out that at lower currents, photoelectrocatalysis process works much better for the removal of carbamazepine. But as you can see, at higher currents, both processes worked almost similarly. It indicates that UV energy plays a more important role at, higher, at lower currents. Now that we have talked about the contamination of water with pharmaceuticals, I'm going to talk about the contamination of water with waterborne pathogens and related diseases. Most of you have probably heard of at least two of these. Salmonella and E. coli. Waterborne diseases such as diarrhea and gastrointestinal diseases caused by various bacteria, viruses, and protozoa have been the causes of many outbreaks in the world. For example, Canada's worst ever E. coli outbreak that took hold in May 2000 in Walkerton, Ontario, at which seven people died and 2,500 people out of 5,000 population at the time fell sick. According to World Health Organization, each year, 3.4 million people, mostly children, die from contaminated water. According to UNICEF, United Nations Children Foundation, each day, 4,000 children die from contaminated water. So by improving water quality, the global diseases can be reduced by approximately 4%. So this is very important concern that has to be addressed. So we tested the effectiveness of our selected coding composition for the inactivation of a test microorganism, which was, in our case, non-pathogenic E. coli. When there was no current, current passing through the electrochemical cell, no change in the concentration of E. coli was observed after 60 minutes. When there was a small amount of current passing through the cell, there was a small decrease in concentration of E. coli after 60 minutes. By further increasing the current, up to 0.5 amp, there was almost instantaneously complete inactivation of E. coli in about 30 seconds. And that's very fast. And the energy usage for this inactivation was about 30 milliwatt hour per liter. How much is this energy? This is like you turn on a 30 watt lamp for 3.5 seconds, which is not that much. Does this method only work on non-pathogenic bacteria? No. We also tested this method for the inactivation of pathogenic E. coli and also a, an, a more resistant bacteria called E. faecalis. And in all cases, the system inactivated bacteria in a relatively short time. So this method works for most of the bacteria and pathogens. The results we just saw showed us that the electrochemistry-based technologies work effectively for the removal of the harmful and persistent contaminants from water and wastewater, including organics such as dyes, pharmaceuticals, bacteria, and pathogen. And this is very promising in the context of water purification. I personally would like to contribute to a work that takes us to a better world in the future with improved water quality, 
that ensures the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all, for this generation of citizens and the next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selena.